Welcome to Extreme Lives. Today we're joined by Ahmed Al Mohammadi, who is a consultant with the Malaysian police. Ahmed has interviewed over 80 uh, militant detainees, ranging from Malaysian nationals to foreign fighters, young and old. Ahmed, welcome to Extreme Lives. Thank, Thank you for joining me. Thank so, you very Ahmed, much. Your work with the Malaysian police, you've yes. interviewed around 80 people. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about um, how you got involved with this and how long you've been doing this kind of work? Well, actually, I evolved in this since 2011. Uh, well, actually, uh, if I remember uh, during those uh, years, 2011 was uh, we have a former member of Jamaat Islamiyah and also Kumpulan Mujahideen Malaysia, KMM, and also DI, and now we have Daesh. So over the years since now, actually, I, I have interviewed more than 80 plus individuals. Or okay, so in you, you started off with Jama Islamia, which mm. was the the mm. more um, Southeast Asian mm. uh, group look, that was trying to set up the the Islamic State mm. in Southeast Asia. But now the militants in this region have become more internationalized, mm. haven't they? You've got people going to the mm. Middle East, you've got people wanting to go to the Philippines, you've got new fronts opening all the time. Mm -hmm. So how are you finding people are recruited now? When you talk to them, do they talk about the, Im the importance of sort of like online recruiting, things that they might see on social media, or is it still more face-to-face -face recruitment? Uh, social media is a key to recruitment. Uh, social media is a very, very powerful tool that they can reach um, mass recruitment, actually. Before this, we have uh, Jama Islamia, for example, they use one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but now uh, they have access to the social media uh, application that they can use it. And how do they put out these messages? And of course, uh, effective recruitment is not only about tools, but also about powerful messages. It's about uh, effective recruiter, it's about uh, vulnerable groups, and we put this together, we can have effective recruitment. And so, when you talk about the vulnerable groups, what mm. makes somebody vulnerable to recruitment in, from, from the understanding of the people you've spoken to? Is, mm. There, mm. is there something that, that is, is similar to some people, or is every case very individual? Um, Yes, um, we have a million of people out there, uh, young people, old people, whatever generation. But is uh, this kind of messages only affect a certain type of individual? Okay, so we must understand this. Not everybody out there is actually vulnerable or exposed to, whenever they get exposure to this. Uh, okay, now why? What make them vulnerable is because of the they have inherent personal vulnerabilities, um, fragile personality. Uh, personal problems, uh, unstable emotion, and they have this so-called uh, cogn cognitive distortion, uh, narcissism, unstable family institutions. You will create an individual which is vulnerable to all kind of messages. It's not only in militancy but also other social problems. So the messages that are putting we're putting out. So let's talk about the the sort of video messaging that's happening at the moment. Is it put out on? Mm. Uh, YouTube, mm -hmm. Facebook, Twitter, but is it also on the messaging apps, things <clears throat> like WhatsApp groups mm -hmm. and Telegram mm -hmm. groups? Where, where would this messaging be put out? Uh, we are speaking about the broad range of uh, social media application, smartphone, uh, Facebook. They, they started with, uh, um, how can I say this, um, popular kind of application like Facebook, for example. Of course, Facebook is, uh, is a natural thing, like uh, you can use it for bad purposes, bad, good purposes. So they hijack this application and they put out the messages, uh, large scale. Everybody can watch, everybody can hear that. So um, they, they not only use Facebook, Twitter as well, YouTube, blogs, uh, Instagram. In Instagram, by the way, they also use that. And now they're getting more discreet, like um, WhatsApp mm -hmm. and Telegram application, because they believe that these kind of tools um, is impenetrable. Uh, security agencies cannot penetrate into that, and they have can they can have a safe conversation in there, exchange information and views. Okay. Well, we have uh, a bit of video here that we'll show, mm -hmm. and then we, you can tell us a little bit about it after we've watched it. Okay. <laughs> تعرض للأذى في سبيل الله ومن ذلك فتنة السجن لدى الطاغوت وبعدما من الله عليه بالخروج نفر إلى الفلبين 
وأسس كتيبة مجاهدة كانت من أوائل المبايعين للخليفة So Ahmed, in this video mm. we see a group mm. of militants. Mm. Can you explain what's going on here? As you can see, it's very powerful uh, messages. Um, it's, it's a call for people in this region to uh, give a pledge of allegiance, a bay'ah, to Abu Bakr Baghdadi, just like what they did. Uh, these propaganda videos calling people in this region to do, to do the same thing. Like if you are in Malaysia, if you are in Singapore, if you are in Southern Thai or elsewhere, they have to do the same because the establishment of the Khalifa is taking place as we speak right now. And so is this a unifying message for militants who uh, are, going, are, are wanting to join a battlefield? Or mm. Is there a distinction between those who want to go to the Philippines or those who aim to go to the Middle East? Uh, or is this a way to kind of unify the, the, the jihadi battlefield? The good things about this uh, militant group is that they speak in one voice, uh, unlike us who speak in different voices, who speak in different uh, language. Oh, no, it's not language, but in different messages. They have one message for everybody. So even though you speak from Philippines, you speak from uh, Indonesia, or you speak from Malaysia, the message is one. And this is an echo from the master narrative of the first message that they received from Abu Bakr Baghdadi. And these people are located where when they're, when they're making this message? Uh, it is in our region, in the southern Philippines. Um, it is not in Middle East. So when you speak to people, do they tell you about, I want to go to the Middle East? Is that still a major pull or do, is there a difference between mm. people who want to join the battlefield in the Philippines or what, what is it that differentiates where people might end up? Is it just opportunity to get there? Um, originally, they want to go to the Middle East because Middle East has a special position uh, in the discourse of militancy. Syria, for example, it is a special place. They call it uh, the land of the prophets. So we want to go there. They want to go there. But now they, we receive a message. They receive a message saying that if you can't go to Syria, if you have a difficulty going there to Hijrah to Syria, then we have a nearer place that is in, in Marawi, for example, or in Myanmar, because which is nearer. So if you have opportunity, if there is opportunity for you to go, just go. We're going to talk more about Myanmar in a minute, but mm -hmm. first of all, I want to show another video, yeah. and then we're going to talk a little bit about that after this. Okay. So we'll have a, a quick look at another video. ونشر الكفر والرذيلة بين الموحدين وما احتلالهم ليستمر حتى يومنا هذا إلا من خلال الوكلاء المرتدين من بني جلدتنا إن الطواغيت في هذه الدول قد أوغلوا في دماء المسلمين So Ahmed, what's happening in this video? Can you explain the, the messaging that's going on in this video? Uh, it's a propaganda video. Uh, it's as, as I said earlier, is continuity from the first video. It's a very powerful message. Uh, calling people in this region, uh, well, okay, you can't go to Syria. We are opening up a new front here in South East Asia. So, uh, but they try to contextualize uh, the narrative. Uh, well, before we have Syria, now you don't have to go there. In, if you look at in your country as well, the problem is the same. So you have to start a war against in your own country. So who are they, who are they targeting here and, wh and what is their message? We see uh, this video is, is cut as edited between mm. groups of militants and, and groups of their own leaders. Mm -hmm. You see uh, the leaders from Malaysia, you see the me leaders from Indonesia, mm -hmm. but you also see Western leaders in mm -hmm. this video. So mm -hmm. what is the message and, and, and is it hitting home hard? Is this something that, mm -hmm. that is resonating with the people you're talking to? To some people, yes. Um, if you look at the videos, uh, uh, they talk about uh, many countries, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines. So they say that if you look at your country, what's going on in your country, you can see that your leaders, in collusion with the foreign leaders, plundering this country, and you're not going to do anything about it. That's why they say that you have to take arms and fight back, just like in the similar fashion that they did in Syria. So this is, this is the meaning when I say that they have they've spoken in one voice, one message, 
and give assumption to one leadership. So this concept of the corrupt West、mm. and the wars that it's perpetuated on Muslims、mm. in Iraq, Syria,、mm. etc.,、mm. um, the bombing from above,、mm. the the backing of the Israelis against the Palestinians,、mm. but they're also linking in here their own governments,、yes. calling their considering their own governments、mm. corrupt and in collusion.、Mm. Does this make a powerful narrative for people to both rise up? Within their own countries, and perhaps perpetuate terror attacks within Malaysia in this instance. Precisely,、um, even though it may not resonate to majority of people、uh, in Southeast Asian country, for example, but there, you would find a certain group of people feel the connection with the message that they receive, especially if they sense the persecution or something wrong, or the sense of injustice committed against them or against the Muslim outside their country. They would say, "Yes, why our leaders not doing anything about it? Perhaps they are also in collusion with the foreign leaders who are trying to perpetuate this kind of conflict. So it gives them more.、Uh, I mean, it, the message become more powerful." And so we've spoken a little bit about the online recruitment, but face to face recruitment is still incredibly important in Southeast Asia, isn't it? Can you tell me about key recruitment methods, face to face recruitment、mm. methods from the detainees that you've spoken to? Uh, it started with the online recruitment, but it would end up with a face-to-face recruitment.、Uh, as I said earlier, mass recruitment is where you have a large catchment, and the, and after that you will sift through or you will filter this、uh, individual, and you will find a smaller group of people, and you would place them in a special group or in circle, and from there you are going to filter again and to create and to put in another special group, and. At the end of it, you're going to have face-to-face、uh, engagement. And how important are key recruiters, key face-to-face recruiters, in this context? Are、mm. there are they、uh, well known to the to、mm. people like you who study、mm. study this?、Uh, are there people who keep names who keep coming up again and again?、Um, no, actually, they are.、Um, uh, when we speak about the recruiter. They always have very, very powerful recruiter or very effective recruiter. One of them was、uh, Muhammad Wandi. He's from Malaysia, but he was killed in Syria recently.、Um, Muhammad Wandi was a key recruiter for Katibano Santara in the region. So Katibano Santara, if you can explain what it what it is.、Uh, yeah, Katibano Santara is a group of、uh, group、uh, is a group of people in Syria, but they are coming from Southeast Asia. They are coming from Singapore, from Singapore, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Philippines, but they are grouped together. They are trained together, and、uh, they 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 have they know each other. This is very important because whenever the conflict is over, they're going to go back to their countries and start the group again. So getting to know among themselves and coming back to the region so that they can have a networking and helping one another. And so this recruiter was working. To recruit people for the the Katipa Nusantara, the Nusantara Brigade in Syria, is that right? Yeah, it is based in Syria. But、uh, after his death,、uh, one his death,、uh, the recruitment drive in the region dropped so significantly because there is no one actually can actually up to the standard of one day. So the the death of one man、mm. in in battle or or perhaps targeted.、Mm. Um, Really dropped the ability for these groups to to recruit from Southeast Asia. Yes, is that, is that what happened? You noticed a, a yes, a there is a、drop. big drop of recruitment drive,、right? but it sustained. I mean, it is it was sustained by other individual, but it it is it was not as great as one day because one day has a, is a large networking.、Uh, he can detect uh, if uh, the person on the other side of the line is a real person, a fake person, or just a bogus. He has that tendency to do the cross-check、uh, background of、uh, each members that join his group or WhatsApp group or Telegram group. Other people do not have that kind of connection. That's why the drive was the recruitment drive was like a drop so significantly and until today. And you spoke briefly about Myanmar before,、mm. and has how big a draw is Myanmar and the perceived persecution of the Rohingya, the people who've had to flee across the border、mm. to, to to Bangladesh.、Mm. How how much of a driver is that for militants in Southeast Asia? It's getting stronger.、Mm. Uh, Myanmar is another hot spot in Southeast Asia. I spoke so many times. If we don't settle the problem in Myanmar, it would be a bigger problem in Southeast Asia because、um, you open up a new front 
for them to go. They have Marawi before, they have Indonesian uh, militant group inside Indonesia and Malaysia as well. And some people from Singapore as well, I mean, being arrested because of that. So if we don't settle the Myanmar issue, then they're going to big, uh, they're going to pull a lot of people going there through easy way, hard way. But there is another pool. So the people you've been speaking to, um, mm. the militants you've been interviewing, mm. what do they say about Myanmar? How do they feel about what's happening in Myanmar in terms of, of, some, of something that is motivating them to either uh, fight mm. or try to get mm. access? Is this, what's, is this what you're hearing? Yes. Uh, actually, um, the issue on Myanmar... Uh, I remember I read this statement by Abu Bakr Ba'ashi. He was saying that, uh, please don't persecute Muslim in Myanmar because we are going there. That was in 2000, perhaps in 2011 or maybe 2010. I heard this. Abu Bakr Ba'ashi was saying something like this. And in 2011... So we're talking about the spiritual leader of Jama'a Islamiyah. Jama'a Islamiyah before. Mm. So I would say uh, Muslim, a uh, certain group of Muslim in Southeast Asian region, sympathetic with people in Myanmar and that is dangerous because uh, that is going to lead them to uh, set up a networking and uh, create a kind of uh, militancy uh, in, in Myanmar itself. And on the the chatter groups, mm. the, the, the Twitters, uh, sorry, the, the WhatsApps and the Telegrams, what are people saying about Myanmar recently? in the context of the fact that so many people have been forced to leave, so many Rohingya yeah. have been forced to leave. If I can summarize it, the narrative would be, we've been doing this humanitarian things for so long, why don't we try uh, jihadi activities in Myanmar? Uh, it may solve the problem, perhaps. This may find uh, some kind of appeal to certain group of people. And this is very dangerous if we don't take care of this, it's going to pose a bigger threats. So what are they proposing? I mean, it must be very difficult for them to, to organize something in, in, a, in a country that they're not familiar with, perhaps it has no established networks already. What are they proposing on the, I mean, what are people putting forward as thoughts on how they, they should push this issue forward? You, you must understand, that we must understand this thing. Whenever there is a militant group of, group of people who says, we are going there, uh, they mean business. Even though we say that it is difficult, even though we say that it is impossible, even though we say it can't happen, it will happen. Because whenever there is a challenge, there is a hardship, there is a creativity, they can make it happen. So the region needs to learn from history here. We have to. And so uh, with Marawi perhaps being defeated, I mean, there are other areas in the Philippines that, mm. that people suspect may be the next Marawi. Uh, do you, but we're not there yet. Mm. Do you feel that perhaps there are militants in Southeast Asia that are kind of looking for the new battleground? Of course. Um, we have to understand this. The fall of uh, Raqqa, for example, and the fall of Marawi will produce something. will produce a byproduct. Um, the second generation, perhaps, of, of uh, ISIS, or what they call this as the veteran of ISIS. Where are they going? There are thousands of them stuck in Turkey, stuck in Raqqa. Where are they going to? According to history, if we study the Afghan war, they will go to the next battleground. Uh, after Afghan war, for example, we have Bosnia. They went to Bosnia. Some of them went back to their home countries. They created Jama Islamia. They created Kumpulan Mujahideen Malaysia, Darul Islam, and so, and so forth. I suspect that we are going to see the same phenomenon. But do you see that militants of all different ethnicities and uh, who have been fighting in perhaps Syria, in Iraq, do you think they'll realistically come to, to Asia or try to come? Wasn't there some difficulties between the groups, with, between the, the Nusantara Brigade that we were talking about before and their yeah. uh, Arab counterparts? They didn't get along so well, did they? Oh, yeah, definitely. It is not them who is going to come. Uh, they may serve as the inspirer or someone who spark. Um, they are maybe sitting in Jordan or in, in, in Lebanon or elsewhere, but they can actually project the idea of the people on the ground. So what I'm talking about here is not the physical individual who travels to the location and create the group, but the ideas. That's why I interviewed former member of Jama'a Islam, 
Jamaat Islamiyah before who were quite frankly told me you can you can kill my organization but you can't kill my ideology I don't believe what he said before but I, I interviewed him in 2011 in 2013 Jamaat Islamiyah was reactivated and they renamed it into some other name like Tamzin Al-Qaeda in Malaysia by the same person uh, the former member of Jamaat Islamiyah ideology remains but the organization may change like, may eradicate it completely but just a, they go into the the, the college uh, hibernation period they are there but and inactive but with very there is a moment and there is a right time they would resurface so you also work in de-radicalization mm -hmm. so that's the end the end product of of these interviews so mm -hmm. you you want to know how to to learn how to deal with with yes. with militants and and de-radicalize de-radicalize them so you're saying here that things need to fundamentally change for mm. people to be de-radicalized mm. or else these groups will still keep popping up wherever an opportunity mm. is given. So what can be done then? Well, for those people who are detained, it is easy because they are inside, then we can organize program for them. So this is uh, how the idea of rehabilitation for militancy is, is coming to existence. So in Malaysia, we have these programs uh, since 2000, early 2000. So it's, until now, we still have the same program, upgraded system after the introduction of a new uh, law, that is Prevention of Terrorism Act. There is a special provision to organize this program. So inside the detention center, we can organize this dialogue. We can organize, we try to, of course, we try to understand uh, what their belief system for us, uh, their concerns, their grievances, first of all. So, so tell me about the program. I mean, what, what sort of, uh, what, what happens inside the center? Mm. First of all, we, we allow them to speak. We allow them to express themselves. While, Meaning, while being detained? While well, being detained. But of course, uh, it is not the police officer who are present in the, in the meeting or in dialogue. Uh, it is somebody like me from, from the outside, from the academia, for example. So we have a satiza from the outside going to prison and talk to them. So they are allowed to, to speak themselves, to, to explain themselves why they get involved into this, how long does it take for them to do it, what drives them to do it. We have, we have to understand this. And it is actually is a human uh, human motivation. It is nothing mysterious about it. Okay. So whenever we understand about this uh, motivation, then we can figure out how can we respond to that. So this is the starting point of uh, de-radicalization de process, rehabilitation process. Of course, it's a is a long process, but this mm -hmm. is an opening or the beginning of that. And how do you measure success? How do you how do you know if you succeeded in de-radicalizing one person? I mean, Malaysia has mm. quite a big problem mm. with extremists. Mm. I mean, for a small country, what thirty million people? Mm. Mm. You have quite a high number of people who have travelled to the Middle East, for example, and other other groups mm. within uh, Malaysia. Detained inside, yes, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, um, it is easy actually. Uh, the criteria for success is number one. If we can change their mindset, that would be a plus point. If we can change their behavior, we call it success. So here we are talking about hard and soft approach. We don't use soft approach 100%. So we use hard approach, meaning that we need a special law that can serve as a guardrail for them to involve in society. So if you involve again, you'll be detained again. You'll be inside. And the soft approach is where the dialogue comes into play. All right? So a kind of you have to change your mindset and of course your behavior we have a great success for changing of both but i would say it's a small percentage the majority of the detainee would i would say there are three categories of them so the majority of them would retain certain kind of radical ideas but as long as they are not involved in in, in society that not cause harm to others or result to violence that's fine but if they cross the line translating what they believe into actual act or into action, then they cross the line, the authority has the right to detain, to, to detain them again. So, so, so what's crossing the line? Accessing material on the internet? Um, or, reactivating or, or, the group, soliciting fund, uh -huh. uh, recruiting others, uh, uh, having this kind of secret group to recruit young people and so on and so forth. Uh, this considered as violating of the national law. 
So if you don't do it, even though it is right, because we are we are living in a democratic society, you know, it is very difficult just to control people's mind. Everybody is free to profess what they want to believe. But as long as you don't translate that idea into action, that's fine. You can read men come, you can read this book and that book. But if you cause harm, then you are crossing the line. So, so why do you think Malaysia has such a relatively large problem with extremism, having no sort of indigenous separatist issue? Um, there's nothing in Malaysia itself that people are fighting for in terms of vis-a-vis uh, -vis sort of Philippines or Indonesia, where they're fighting for uh, a separate homeland for, for one group or another. Why is it that Malaysia has such a high instance of, of extremism then? Um, I would say number one is because of the sympathetic, right? sympathetic radicalization, maybe we can term that, meaning that people become radicalized, begin, it started with their sympathy, and whenever they learn more about it, they become more radicalized. Yes, we don't have uh, political oppression or conflict inside Malaysia, but we do have conflict outside. And this is the sympathy, the role of sympathy come into play. Whenever you are sympathetic to the people who are being oppressed outside, and the question would be, you, what you're going to do with it here? Are you going? I mean, uh, you just don't do anything. Just sit back and just watch, do something. Uh, so this is how they escalate into a more uh, extreme kind of uh, activities. Because research that's been done before has shown mm. high levels of sympathy for mm. for jihad or mm -hmm. um, even sympathy towards the Islamic State amongst Muslims in Malaysia, mm -hmm. much higher than in, in the rest of the region. Mm. Is this something to do with? the politics in Malaysia, which almost politicizes Islam to an extent that makes this more people more susceptible to, to accept this as, as a reality? I would say this is a very complex issue. It's not only involved a domestic issue like politics of relationship between um, uh, religious community, uh, race, and so on and so forth. It's also involved about the perception of Islam is under the threat, or Muslim is under the threat. Uh, this is uh, the global narrative. I would say it's not only being felt in this part of the world, okay, but it's a, it's a global perception among Muslims that they have this kind of mindset. But they try to project, uh, or they try to contextualize this message or narrative in the local context. So you would say, who is your closest enemy around here? And then they would say, well, perhaps those people who are fighting against or try to undermine the position of Islam, etc., etc. You can see that from the global narrative uh, become a local uh, narrative. Uh, I call this uh, uh, globalization of the local and localization of the global. So meaning that there is no difference between the global narrative and the local narrative. It's become of, the same of course, thing. Perpetuated by social media and social the kind media. of videos that we were looking at earlier. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what can be done? What, do, you, do you ever ask the people who you interview, it's like, what would you like to see happen? You know, what would make you um, change your mind? Mm, one problem we have is a lack of interaction. Uh, it's a paradox, actually. We have a very powerful tools for communication, for social media, WhatsApp, and so on and so forth. But we don't really communicate. We don't really understand. We imagine that we have a neighbor, but we don't talk to them like uh, for over the years. But we talk to the people in New York, in London. More often, the people talk to our neighbor. We lost humanity. We lost the human values. So, uh, relationship in society works that way. Um, we uh, live in the same space, but we don't talk in the real sense of the word. Like we talk, understand human hearts, and uh, that is absent. So, when you don't talk, there is a perception, meaning that I don't know why I don't like you. But you know, you don't ask, you don't talk, you don't express. Eventually, the the perception taken. And then uh, you become like uh, living in the bubble of your own. So more than 80, 80 militants you've spoken to, if you could choose two things that need to be done to stop people being radicalized, what mm. would they be? Two things? What would you, from all the people you've spoken to, mm. and you could change two things, you had a wish list, you could change two things, what would you change so that people would stop being radicalized into these groups? Mm. One is uh, to strengthen family institution. You have, we have to provide, uh, I mean, we are living in the modern age. Everything is so advanced. But our family institution crumbles. Um, uh, the father and mother, the children, 
meaningful conversation doesn't take place. Whenever there is a no effective communication between family, there is no love, there is no caring. Love, care, the sense of, uh, I mean, loving each other is a human need. Mm -hmm. If you don't have it, human, human being can be anyone. It can be anything. Like you can be a terrorist, you can be a, a problem to society, it can be a lot of things. So family institution is the one that we need to correct, we need to look at too. And uh, number two, we need to interact more with the people on the other side, meaning that Muslims, non-Muslim, or uh, I mean people from the same community, we have to interact more uh, to get to know one another so that there is no perception built between them. The wall of perception, the wall of misperception need to be teared down uh, with communication. So again, we have to uh, speak meaningfully to others. Ahmed al Mahamadi, thank you for joining me. You're most welcome. Thank you for joining us on Extreme Lives this evening. Uh, we will be back again on November the 13th and with another episode of Extreme Lives.